Darren Heath on Take a Moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 47 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 047. Well, let's go ahead and get the gun of the show out of the way because we have a very, uh, well, a very serious episode with a lot of content and it's going to take a while to get through it all. However, if you don't want to hear just my voice on this episode, you're in luck. No, 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 no. We don't have any guests on this episode. Instead, we have audio clips. That's right, audio clips. But let's get back to the kind of the show, which in this particular instance is the Ruger 2245 Lite. Well, the Ruger 2245 Lite is a personal favorite of mine, not because it's a, an unusual gun, but because it's got an unusual color. This is, I, I'll be honest, I was an early adopter. And this particular gun has a gold finish. For those who don't know, the first generation 2245 lights did have the gold finish. I jokingly refer to this gun as the pimp gun. But anyways, the main reason I bought it was it has the threaded barrel and it can accept 1911 grip panels. The threaded barrel means that when I do eventually get around to purchasing a suppressor for my rim fires, I can put the suppressor on the 2245 light. Hmm, very interesting. Now, the 2245 light is a uh, is an aluminum gun to a large extent, at least on the upper receiver. The grip frame is polymer, and this makes for a very, very light gun. That's the light, the word light in the name. However, let's just go ahead, throw the specs out there, and then we'll run an audio clip and get into the feedback. The model number on the 2245 light that I have is 3900. It is chambered in 22 long rifle, has a capacity of 10 plus 1. It is a single action firearm. The hammer is concealed within the frame, I might add. The rear sight is adjustable. The front sight is fixed. The materials in the gun are a polymer frame, aluminum receiver with a steel barrel. Now the barrel is pencil thin and under tension within the, within the uh, aluminum receiver. So you really get a very light and yet a very... Uh, reliable design. Now the gun weighs in at 22.8 ounces and the MSRP does not matter on this one because it is no longer manufactured. They have the blue one and then they have a couple of other variants but not the gold variant anymore. Now that I'm through rushing through that let me uh, run the audio clip that tells you how to get the show and well after that we'll hit the listener feedback. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Domesticated Bill wrote in, and I don't have his email in front of me anymore, but I do recall that he's a new listener. However, he wrote in to let me know that he truly enjoyed the Four Horsemen episode. Beyond that, he wants to know if there will be any coverage of federal issues on this podcast. Domesticated Bill, thank you for the feedback. And should federal legislation show signs of being passed in some form, then I will go ahead and cover it. However, with a conservative pro-gun leaning legislative branch and a very well-known anti-gun executive branch, I doubt legislation is going to go anywhere. Now, I know there people want me to cover the uh, the one-sided gun control that's coming from the executive branch, but every other podcast out there is doing that. So I don't really want to go back and touch on what they have already covered, not when there's nothing that applies to Texas beyond what applies to other states. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it doesn't apply to Texas. It does. It applies to Texas every bit as much as it applies to the other states, but it does not apply to Texas any more than the other states either. With that in mind, I really don't care about it. At least not from covering it on this episode. You want to get federal issues? There, there's pretty much every other gun rights episode, uh, gun rights podcast out there that's going to cover the federal issues. And well, let's just go ahead and move on to our next email, which Wilson H wrote in to tell me he doesn't appreciate the fact that I, that I am not demanding we damn the torpedoes and demand. A push for unlicensed carry or no carry at all. Okay. You know what? I'm going to cover unlicensed carry when it makes progress. 
Now, regarding that, you know, the idea that I should demand unlicensed carry or no carry at all, I'm not going to do that. I want to move the ball forward. If I move it a foot, that's good. If I move it uh, 10 yards, even better. But here's the deal. We cannot remain static. And the idea that we should remain static unless we get everything is a bad idea. To do so will basically have us given up ground to our opposition. Think about it like football. You make a play, and instead of getting a touchdown, you just run it 12 yards. But rather than take the 12 yards you gained, you go back to the same point and play for a different, or instead of playing for a first down, you know you're playing for a second, third, or fourth down. That's right. It makes no sense. Just like the unlicensed carry or no carry at all makes no sense. And thus, you now know why I do not uh, demand that we do one thing and nothing at all or nothing at all. It's counterproductive. With that said, I want to run the social media audio clip and we'll be right back. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook, you can follow it on Twitter, you can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. Well, this episode is what I should have done for episode 46. However, I was sick, so, well, it didn't happen. In the show notes, I want to throw up a link to the video where you can watch the whole Senate hearing yourself if you haven't already. But, you know what? This is not something I recommend doing. After nearly nine hours of watching video, let me just say that uh, I was a little loopy. You keep hearing people making the same arguments over and over and over and over and over and over. Well, you get the point. Well, let me tell you right now. This episode has taken a lot of time to prepare. There was the nine hours I watched the video, but then a lot, and it was actually, it actually took me a lot longer than nine hours to do it because I was taking notes. I had to go back and replay sections sometimes several times. And, you know, there's over six hours of processing audio to get it where I can just push a button on the tablet and let you hear what was said. And keep in mind, I'm not getting paid anything to do this. I am doing this because it matters to me, just like I assume you're listening to this podcast because it matters to you. However, you know, there's a lot of time went into the development of the episode, and, well, I think it's time just to go ahead and pull up some, uh, let's see here, I'm trying to access what I'm looking for. Okay, there we go. Anyways, I think it's time to pull up some audio clips and let you hear what was actually said. And I want to run the first audio clip. This is from Tara Mitcha, and I apologize. I have called her Tara Micah in ev- earlier episodes, and I apologize for mispronouncing her name, but it's Tara Mitcha. And I'm certain I just mispronounced it again, but anyways, let me run the audio clip, and then I'll come back and comment on it. Uh, yes, ma'am. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Tara Mitcha. I lobby for the National Rifle Association here in Texas and in three other states. Um, I want to draw on my experience real quickly in those three other states as I stand in support of Senate Bill 17 by Senator Estes. Um, for 15 years, I've lobbied in New Mexico, Louisiana, Mississippi. Uh, All of those states are open carry states. You are not required to have a license even to carry openly in any of those states. I would describe the situation there with open carry as fairly rare, unalarming, and few, if any, enforcement issues. And that's open carry without a license. What Senator Estes is proposing here is simply replicating the system we already have in place for concealed carry. All righty. Basically, you had her introduce herself, tell you where all she's lobbying that, and then she tells you basically the uh, Senate Bill 17 is basically the same laws that apply to open carry or to concealed carry would apply to open carry. I mean, it's just an extension of what we currently do, and that's great. This is possibly the best ex- uh, explanation of the bill that anybody has had uh, that I have heard, and it's a great thing to have out there. And now she's going to go into a little more detail and explain how it just changes the method of carry in this next audio clip. All he's looking to change is the method of carrying. All right. All he's looking to change is the method of carrying. I got the wrong audio clip there. 
In fact, I I think I deleted the no 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 that was part of the first one. Originally, that was the first one was going to be two. Sorry about that. But anyway, she says she explains all the changes is the method of carry, meaning you now can carry concealed or you can carry open. That's all that's changed about it. But then she does something that kind of lays the groundwork for future progress. And let me run that one for you. I don't expect Texans to behave any less responsibly or less law-abidingly than the people I represent and work with and have become friends with in those three other states that have far fewer restrictions than what he's proposing. All right, right there. If you'll notice, she said that Texans are basically, she expects them to be every bit as law-abiding as these other people. And these other states have unlicensed carry. In other words, right now she's a line, she's basically telling them, look, your fears that this is going to cause blood in the streets and all that, there's nothing to it. It's not happening in these other three states, and I expect Texans to be a much more, or to be every bit as law-abiding as these other people, maybe even more so, because now this bill is a licensed bill. You have to have a background check in order to get the license. Texas concealed handgun license holders tend to be some of the most, well, responsible and uh, basically some of the most um, law-abiding citizens out there. So to expect anything other than Texans to behave every bit as well as uh, people in the other three states that she represents, well, the only thing you can expect them to do differently is to actually be more law-abiding. However, you know what? We got another audio clip from uh, Alice Tripp, who we've had on this show. And Alice is going to point out that the TSRA is in support of this bill. And with that said, let me go ahead and just run that particular audio clip. As far as SB 17 licensed open carry, we're totally in support of it. Okay. The TSRA is totally in support of Senate Bill 17. Now, if you'll notice, she did not introduce herself in that audio clip. That's because uh, she changed the order of things from Tara Mitchell. And when I get to her audio clip where she introduces herself, it'll be later in the show. Now, these audio clips are taken out of the testimony that was given. So they, most of the time, the person involved introduces themselves. Sometimes I leave in where the uh, state, uh, where the committee chairman or the uh, vice chairman uh, tells them they can speak. So that way they can, you know, who's talking at least at some point. Now, Alice also explains the growing support for open carry in this next audio clip. My last question would be, tell me, how many here have a concealed handgun license and so many hands would go up? How many here, if it was legal in Texas, would carry openly and more and more and more hands went up over the years as people had computers and was they were able to find out what was going on in other states? They started trying that model on for themselves. I found women even saying in Rotary Clubs, I want it, I'd open carry. If for no more than as Mike Cox says, I'm a rancher, I have a license to carry concealed. But I occasionally go check, I occasionally go check the mailbox on the other side of the county road. I'm I've committed an offense if I do that. Um, Concealed handgun licensees, 811,000 active licenses, have demonstrated for 20 years that they are the most law-abiding. If a sign will stop you, you've got to be a good person. You just have to be. All righty. Right there. You know what? She's explained that there's more people, more and more support for open carry. And she's basically saying, look, these are the most law-abiding people in Texas. And guess what? She's right. Now, our next audio clip comes in from Terry Holcomb. And he has, he has also been on the podcast. I will admit that. So let me go ahead and run Terry Holcomb's audio clip. This bill uses all the current CHL laws that are in place today with very, very minimal changes. Um, it's been vetted over two sessions. This isn't new. It's not a new issue. George Lavender has been working on this uh, for several sessions, and this is basically the substitute work um, from the last two sessions. It basically just does three simple things. Um, it re- obviously removes the concealed requirement. 
Um, that's obvious. You know, that's the primary purpose of the bill. The second thing it does is it does add a holster requirement. Um, we could probably have some discussion around this. Uh, some of my members have requested that we do not dictate which type of holster, but that they would be okay with just saying holster. Um, but that's something that I will let uh, the uh, committee decide on their own. Um, there are ladies that have told me that they would like to have thigh holsters um, if they're wearing shorts or something like that. So just something for the committee to consider. I'd appreciate that. Uh, the mo one of the most important things this bill does do, and, and I've heard senators ask questions about this, and it's something that we considered um, when we began to work on this bill, is it does take private property rights very seriously. Um, we all know what the 30 out 6 provision is. Um, if a business does not want you entering their facility, uh, concealed carrying, they put up a 30 out 6, which is a criminal trespass of a license holder sign if, if you so enter while carrying. Um, Texas Carry agrees that a private property should have a uh, private property owner should have the right um, to say yes or no to that, and so we fully uh, support the 30 out seven provision, which would be the same exact thing for 30 out six, but for open carry. All right, the you basically you're hearing Texas Carry's position on the bill. They have worked on helping pass this bill, so that's good. And I'm going to I'm going to say that you know basically you have. You have three lobbyists right here in a row basically saying, hey, this bill's good. Pass it. Now, let's go ahead and move on to the first person that I really wanted to cover that had something negative to say about this. And it's not really negative, but, well, first off, let's hear him introduce himself because I want to touch on that for a moment. My name is Don McKinney, and I'm an assistant chief with the Houston Police Department. I've been employed by the police department for 32 years. There has been and will continue to be much discussion on this bill. I'm here just to speak on Senate Bill 17. All right. He's just there to speak on Senate Bill 17. But he's the he says he is the assistant chief for the uh, Houston Police Department. The thing is, if you go online, you can actually see the uh, command structure for the Houston Police Department. And uh, they really could have a case of too many chiefs and not enough Indians. Because there's a whole lot of assistant chiefs in the Houston Police Department. To say he is the assistant chief would imply that he is, well, pretty high up in there. But, you know, according to their website, he's like in the third tier of, of chiefs and assistant chiefs. They have a chief, then they have a whole passel of assistant chiefs. And I believe his name appears in third row of people. <laughs> yeah. But anyways, I may see if I can pull that link up and add that back into the show notes. But let's go to where he actually, uh, well, where he put, gives you the Houston Police Department's position on holsters. I commissioned our police academy to provide some input on this bill. And what they have come up with, I'd like to share with the committee, if I may. Yes, sir. To be able to open carry, it is strongly recommended that a minimum level two, preferably level three holster be required, and that an additional 16 hours over and above the CHL class be mandated as far as self-defense and weapon retention. This is submitted respectfully on behalf of the Chief Police of Houston. I'll uh, entertain any questions. Okay, so basically a level two, preferably a level three holster be required by law, except no other state has this. And uh, he also says that another 16 hours of training, basically, um, no. Think about it. Right now, you have to have, I don't remember if it's four or six hours in order to be able to have the class, or in order, you have to have a four or six hour class, I forget which it is, in order to get your concealed handgun license. But let's say it's four hours, and then you have an additional 16 hours added onto that. That's 20 hours. Essentially, this is just somebody saying, well, you got to have X number of hours to do this. No, this is an effort to require too much time, drive the cost up and make people even less likely to do, to do it. And I don't like it. I really don't. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not one of those that's saying, well, you got to have constitutional carry because of the cost, because it's a tax. No, you hear that enough in this. And that's not the angle I'm coming at. What I'm coming at is there should be nothing added to it to make it more difficult for people to carry. And yet Houston PD wants an additional 16 hours of training and a very specific type of holster used. Hmm, that's no bueno. However, you know, I'm going to run this next one by you. If you, uh, 
I am going to say, please, please do not uh, spit all over your uh, monitor or your listening device if you're taking a drink of something because you never thought I would play this person's voice on here. But, uh, well, let's run the audio clip and then I'll come back and explain why I am running it. Um, Mr. Watkins? Yes, thank you for having me. Um, I wanted to touch uh, base on some of the things I've heard earlier. Um, so, uh, you guys have been talking about rights and CHL. Um, CHL is not a right. Um, once you have the CHL, it becomes a privilege. Here in Texas, we actually don't have a right to, to keep and bear arms. We're actually asking our government for permission and paying a tax for it. Okay. Basically, Corey Watkins is uh, sitting there. He's saying, well, uh, you got to. You, we're having to beg permission to carry a gun. Mm, not really, because, well, uh, Corey, I think you've been walking around with a AR, AK and other people with you have been rock, walking around with ARs and other long guns. You walk around with a black powder revolver. You're not going to make a case that you're being denied your rights. You may, be, you may make a case that your rights are being infringed on, just not wholly infringed upon. But don't. Don't be making a case that uh, you're being infringed, that your rights are being wholly infringed on when it's when they're not. In fact, uh, let me play the part where he wants he wants them to amend it so it's unlicensed carry. So I would like to see this this uh, these bills uh, have an amendment to where we don't have to ask for permission and pay a tax and get our fingers printed like criminals. Okay, now there's been a lot of news articles talking about Corey Watkins and his uh, checkered past. Makes you wonder if he has reason to not want his fingerprints run. Hmm, very much a possibility. But then he goes on, he uh, he actually says that he will continue to walk around with a long gun. And thus he destroys his argument that uh, his rights are being wholly infringed. Well, let's run that audio clip. Um, if you choose to go against my God-given rights, I will continue to walk around with an AK-47 um, with no license, no rules, no regulation. So I don't understand why you wouldn't give me the option to do it with a modern-day handgun. It just doesn't make sense. Okay. So Corey's, Corey's telling us he's going to walk around with it after he said that, he, that we're making him beg for government permission for his rights. Mm, non sequitur. But then he uh, actually... He kind of threatens the legislature with, I don't know if he's threatening them with violence or if he's threatening, no, it doesn't quite sound like that. But in light of his uh, treason is punishable by death video, it, a case could be made. Or if he's threatening to run a candidate against him in every primary, I don't know. But let's go ahead and run a little thing where he talks about walking until his feet bleed to make sure that they don't uh, get it, they don't uh, hold elected office again, shall we? If you guys do decide to go against this, I will walk until my feet bleed to make sure that you never are an elected official again. You're going against the oath that you took, and you should take it very seriously. Um, shall not be infringed means no license, no rules, no regulations. Time, Thank you very Thank you. much for being here. Okay. Well, Corey, I am going to say that he is somebody that needs to kind of lay off the coffee or other stimulants. I mean, he's in pretty good shape in this one. Sometimes he looks like he's on downers, like in his uh, Treason is Punishable by Death video. I don't know what's going on in the head of Corey Watkins, but I'm certain it's probably a very fascinating place, especially if you're a uh, psychologist or psychiatrist. If you're a mental health professional, you might want to write a paper on this man. Then we have Pablo Frias. I hope I pronounced that correctly. We'll find out in just a moment. But he, he continues to remind the committee of their oath of office in order to get them to support open carry. And I'm going to run that audio clip. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Pablo Frias, and I'm from Tarrant County. And I would I would like to touch the, the same topics that other individuals have already touched upon, and it is uh, your constitutional oath. You, you all swore an oath to the Constitution, and, and we as citizens uh, would hope that you would respect that oath. Okay. So if everybody has done that, and you're going to remind them again, why are you wasting your time? You have two minutes. You could make a much more persuasive argument than repeating something and telling them you're repeating something that other people have told them. But then we have Justin Wallace from Gun Rights Across America. And this one actually gets interesting. My name is Justin Wallace, and I am here representing Gun Rights Across America. Um... As most of us Texans know, we are at a critical moment in Texas. SB 11 and 17 have been approved for a public hearing, which we're here today, um, and subsequent vote. Gun rights across America would like it to be known 
that we will not waver on our stance nor compromise our core beliefs. Gun rights across America will also support and fight for the rights of our citizens, uh, not only in the state of uh, Texas, but in this great nation, to be fully restored as per the Constitution. Um, We at Gun Rights Across America believe that as citizens of this nation, we should not be taxed to exercise our God-given natural rights. Gun Rights Across America will also hold true to its word and support and defend any pro-gun bill that would effectively reduce restrictions to expand citizens' rights and lawfully defend and exercise those rights. As SB 11 and 17, as for SB 11 and 17, Gun Rights Across America would like it to be known that as they do not follow our core beliefs, they are, they are nonetheless a positive step forward in restoring Texans' constitutional rights. Okay, so he's basically saying uh, no compromise, but well, we will accept this t- kind of, sort of, because it's a step forward. That kind of sounds like a mix- mixed message to me. But, uh, you know, the next one the next one seems really interesting. I don't know if this guy's got a DeLorean and a flux capacitor, or if he's one of those that has actually been doing this a lot longer than everybody else because it was legal. Although I'm certain that if somebody had been doing this as long as he says he's done it, you would have had a lot more people doing it, too. However, let me go ahead and run the audio clip so you can hear what I'm talking about. My name is Scott Trent. I'm from Hutto, Texas. Uh, I'd like to first uh, say I support both these bills fully. I also support gun rights across America in their stance and anyone else that supports these bills. Um, I don't have anything really prepared today to say. I'm just going to address a couple things I've, I've heard today. Uh, one was concerns with business owners. Uh, I'd like to let uh, senators know that I've been openly open carrying for you know, four to five years now with my long rifle and my black powder pistol, and I've encountered many business owners, uh, patrons of those businesses, law enforcement, and it's almost always a positive encounter. Okay, he's been open carrying a long gun and a black powder for 45 years. I don't know about that. Something just does not seem... Un- I mean, while he, he may have been doing this legally for 45 years, it just does not seem likely. I'm not calling him a liar. I'm just saying it's the statement is pushing the envelope of believability because, well, it just does. Like I said, if he'd been doing this for 45 years, we probably would have heard about it or he would have other people doing it with him much earlier than now. But then uh, he says something that's very, very enlightening. And it's in it's actually in comment. Uh, it's actually in reply to something that uh I believe as Art Acevedo said in the uh, testimony that he gave, although I didn't include his testimony. Uh, well, let me just go ahead and run this next part so you can understand what, why, I, why this is critical to understand. An uh, incorrect statement that was placed earlier by the police chief of Austin. He said he did not have the correct funding or training to deal with open carry in Texas. This is untrue. We've been giving him real life practice for the past several years in downtown Austin. Okay. So you're going to brag that you're uh, having law enforcement encounters uh, because of open carry in order to try and get open carry made more legal. Uh, Okay. So basically you have law enforcement officers saying, well, we're having trouble dealing with these people now and we don't have the training or the money to do so if this law is passed. And you come up and you say, well, he's got plenty of training because we've been making him get the experience. Mm, That's not good political uh, activism. Instead, to me, that's kind of like you're trying to sink the ship while uh, saying you're patching the holes that you're drilling. But then we have Francis Schenken from Texas Gun Sense, and they oppose open carry. Let me just go ahead and run that audio clip. I oppose Senate Bill 17. There are 826,000 concealed handgun license holders in this state. Last session, the legislature cut training by two-thirds. You can renew online with no proficiency in how to handle a gun. Okay. Well, you know, they did cut the training requirement. That's good. It makes it easier for people to get the concealed handgun license. And, you know, it wasn't a reduction of content. It was just a reduction of the time required, of the minimum time they had to be there in order to teach it. And then she also complains that you can get a renewal without having to go to class. Again, this is easy. This makes it easier for people to get it. Imagine it. 
<clears throat> well, think of it kind of like a voter's ID or voter's registration card, okay? Instead of a book that you have to fill out every fo- every page is a form that has to be filled out, we narrow it down to a postcard sized piece of paper that you can fill out, mail in, and uh, you get your voter's registration or you get your voter card in the mail. And then you don't even have to, and then in order to keep you from having to fill out, say, a an abridged version of that book next time, we just automatically send it back out to you. I mean, this is a progressive reform to help people be able to vote. Now, why don't we do the same thing for Carrie? But the next one, the next one's interesting. This is Tammy Kuntz Thompson. I believe we've had Tammy on the podcast when we did the roundtable with uh, the Texas folks and uh, our dear friend from Oklahoma. But let me go ahead and run her run her uh, two minute or so rant for you because this is actually going to be interesting. Tammy Thompson, I'm here to speak um, by myself today. Excuse me, is your name also Tam- your Tammy Kuntz? I just want to make sure it's not two people. <laughs> no, I'm the same person. Okay. I'm, um, Tammy Kuntz is my maiden name. Tammy right. Thompson is my okay, just two, <laughs> married two name. cards with two names. Okay. Sorry, I forgot. That's no problem. Thank you. You may proceed. I'm a mother, and I'm here to um, say I totally support open carry here in Texas. I'm from Kansas. We have open carry without a license in Kansas, so I can walk around with my gun. Um, Grew up on a farm in the country, so that was, you know, acceptable. And I moved to Texas, and I was told I couldn't do that anymore openly, that I could only open carry a long arm. So I am one of those radical moms that walk around Dallas with a... um, AR on my back or uh, black powdered on my hip um, so that I'm able to exercise my Second Amendment right here in Texas. I was rather shocked that Kansas laws were um, much better for our Second Amendment than Texas laws were. Um, one, in every, one in every eight women in Texas are the sole breadwinners of their families. They cannot afford this license or this tax that Texas law has said we must have. Um, I took the CHL class. I wanted to see what it was about and what it would teach me. It really didn't teach me anything more than what I did in Kansas with open carry without a license. Um, But we have a lot of single moms that cannot protect themselves. And by the Texas law, we are literally telling our elderly and our single parents that they are not as important as um, the rich in Texas to protect themselves because they cannot afford that license. That's one of the things I have not heard anybody here talk about today is the license, the price of the license. Um, It's either a license and tax is a infringement on our Second Amendment right. We can't afford it, therefore we cannot protect ourselves. Um, therefore, we're not worthy of it. Okay. Now, uh, I went and looked real quick while that was playing, and yes, uh, she was part of that roundtable we had with Eddie Isaac from the Oklahoma Open Carry Association. But let me let me say here, when she was on the roundtable, she was the Texas coordinator for gun rights across America in Texas. And that begs the question, why didn't she identify herself as the Texas coordinator for gun rights across America in the Senate hearing or at the committee meeting? I don't know. Is she still the gun rights across America coordinator for Texas? Or was it because they already had somebody acting as a spokesman? I don't know. I really don't. But anyways, though, she's talking about people being rich in order to have a concealed handgun license. And yet I'm not rich. In fact, right now I am driving a borrowed vehicle. And yet, I still have a concealed handgun license. Hmm, how about that? I'm not rich, but I have a concealed handgun license. But then again, she says it's only for the rich. But then we have an article from Justin Deloche, or Deloche, and he is, I am trying to find it. Okay, he's the, I believe he's the head of Lone Star Gun Rights, and we're going to run his audio clip right up. Hello, my name is Justin Delosh, and I am the founder and legislative director for Lone Star Gun Rights. On behalf of Lone Star Gun Rights and myself, we believe the licensing requirement should be removed from these bills. There are currently 31 states that have unlicensed open carry. Why not Texas? Okay. He's the uh, uh, he's a legislative director or something like that for it, for Lone Star Gun Rights. Okay. Well, he wants the licensing requirement removed. This is going to be a common theme throughout the uh, throughout the testimony from the open carry advocates. It really is. And then we have Rachel Malone from the Texas Firearms Freedom Group. 
In fact, I don't know if she actually mentions that she's representing them or not in this one, but we'll find out when I run the audio clip. All these have blurred together. My name is Rachel Malone. I'm representing myself in Texas Firearms Freedom. I'm speaking. Okay, she is representing herself in Texas Firearms Freedom. So let me let me start that clip back again. In fact, I'm going to start it over. My name is Rachel Malone. I'm representing myself in Texas Firearms Freedom. I'm speaking on SB 17 and for SB 11. I'm here today because six years ago I set out to prove how stupid and how wrong it was for normal people to carry a gun, especially if everybody could see it. And the result was I became an open carry activist because I found that one in five women um, is a victim of rape or attempted rape. I'm one of five sisters, and that really hits home. I discovered the potential of a gun made criminals less likely to commit crime. The sight of a gun made criminals far less likely, even if the gun was never used. Also, citizens have a far more accurate track record than police when they do have to shoot to stop a threat. So for those who are afraid of people carrying guns everywhere, I get it because I have so been there. Um, But I realized there was no basis for my fear. It was irrational and I was wrong. So as I faced my fears and I countered them with this truth, I became empowered because firearms empower women. I kept thinking, and I realized that everyone deserves the option to choose to carry a firearm, not only permit holders. It's not the police's responsibility to protect us. It's ours. And it's none of the government's business to have authority to grant permission to carry a handgun. So the option of open carrying a handgun is important. Repealing the requirement of a permit also rights a wrong. It levels the playing field, and I ask that you amend SB 17 to remove the requirement of a permit. Okay. Once again, we are repeating ourselves. Okay, we're not repeating our individual selves, but uh, we're repeating what other people have said. We can better use this time and not quite irritate the legislators as much either. But our next one, our next one is one that we've had on the show multiple times. And, well, one that I have personal issues with. But let me go ahead and run the audio. Mr. Uh, Grisham. Yes, sir. Uh, First, I want to correct uh, some sworn testimony that was given by one of the former testimonies about the head of OCT making threatening statements. Uh, I know that's categorically false because I am the head of OCT, and I have never made threatening statements to a single person other than Iraqis when I was in Iraq for a few times. Um, So I'm the head of Open Carry Texas. I'm the founder and the president. So I'm the guy that you get to blame or praise for the, the open carry discussion here in Texas. I'm the guy that's responsible for all the open carry rallies from every corner of the state, all the way down to Harlingen, over to El Paso, up to Texarkana, Red River, Amarillo. I've personally open carried my rifle in every major city in Texas. I plan to hit all five corners of the state this month. Okay. He doesn't have too much of an ego to blame or to praise. He's responsible for it all, yada, yada. Okay. Uh, CJ, uh, if you're listening to this, If you plan to visit all five corners of the state, that means you'll probably be coming through my county. If you're coming through Gaines County, feel free to look me up. Uh, You have my email. You have my phone number. Call me. Email me. Text me. Let me know when you're going to be through here. And maybe we can sit down and have a talk, see if we can iron out our differences in person. Beyond that, well, let me say that he's got a bit of an ego. But, you know, there's more to it. We're going to skip part of his testimony and we'll come back to it. However, we're going to go back, we're going to go ahead and jump ahead to where he's getting on to the open carry subject. and That will begin right about now. I testify on ASB 17 um, because we need to fix the holster requirement. We need to fix the the cost requirement. And we also need to fix the exclusions for minor offenses. We're the only state that bars Class B misdemeanors, nonviolent, from being able to obtain a CHL. Okay. I could actually understand all those and I I could actually live with it. Wait a minute. He didn't say anything about striking the license requirement, though. And until this, until recently, I believe their legislative uh, watch page had them opposing this bill. Interesting. Oh, so interesting. In fact, I think their uh, their legislative uh, page said they refused to, or they were unable to support any kind of license carry bill. And yet, it almost sounds like he is supporting a license carry bill here. But he was followed by Murdoch Pizgati. I assume I mispronounced that. And Murdoch is from Come and Take It. And he wants unlicensed carry. And to that extent, let's run his audio now. I am Murdoch Pizgati, president and co-founder of Come and Take It Texas, a gun rights group with thousands of members. I'll be speaking on SB 17. 
the inalienable right to bear arms has been stripped away from all Texas citizens. And as it stands today, we must pay an extortion fee and obtain a license to conceal carry. And as a CHL holder, which I am, all that separates me from being a criminal is the bottom couple inches of my shirt covering a pistol. With some, some clothing, trying to conceal isn't even an option. Are we so naive to think that this out-of-sight, out-of-mind law keeps anyone safer? Is our excuse that it prevents public pandemonium? 88% of the country already allows open carry of handguns, and 62% is unlicensed without mass public panic. This bill allows only CHL holders to open carry. Why? That one-time six-hour class does nothing to make you a safer gun owner. The CHL does practically nothing more to check your felon status than when you buy a gun at the store. It does nothing to prevent a criminal from carrying a gun when and where they want. It does nothing. Unless you want to talk about the revenue stream it created, because what it does do is tax the law-abiding citizen. It creates barriers for the poor. It's another burden put upon the heads of productive citizens of Texas. Another hoop to jump through. A lot of sound and fury signifying nothing more than a feel-good law for the bleeding hearts. This bill in its present form is unacceptable. Remove the license requirement and give us constitutional carry. If you can legally buy a gun, you should not be stopped from carrying it as you see fit. And to speak uh, to you from earlier, you asked about the reaction of rifles being open carried in big cities. Well, I've organized hundreds of events, thousands across every major city over the last two years with long guns. I can assure you the police have already been retrained on people open carrying, and we've proven that Texas public is ready for this minor change in aesthetics. Thank you very much. Okay. Now we're going to go ahead. We're going to run uh, Jason Orsex. Uh, he's also a co-founder of Come and Take It. And then we'll get to the really interesting part, shall we? Because the last, I'm going to say, five or so audio clips that we're going to touch on in the uh, in the open carry debate, they are the ones that are really interesting. Or four of them are. So let's get Orsex out of the way. I mean, it's basically he wants unlicensed carry too. Or he wants unlicensed carry too. I moved away from the microphone. But let's go ahead and get that out of the way. Hello, uh, my name is Jason Orsick. I'm a co-founder and the vice president of Come and Take It Texas. And first off, I'd like to say thank you for inviting us to testify on, on these two bills today, Senate Bill 17 and 11. Um, I wish that I could talk about how proud I am to be here today and speak on these bills, but it would honestly be a lie. Actually, I'm very embarrassed. Oh, I'm embarrassed that my state lawmakers would even present to us a watered-down version of licensed open carry as this bill is currently written. This bill fails to replenish any liberty or rights to Texans as it's written. All this bill does is grants another privilege to privileged individuals that can afford the Texas CHL fees and meet the requirements. The Texas CHL is allegedly a shall-issue license, but it is not. It is only shall-issue if you can meet the requirements and pay the fees. Some of the restrictions that would prevent someone from being granted a Texas CHL are not preventive of them owning or buying a firearm. In other words, you can be 100% legal to own and buy firearms and not obtain a Texas CHL. Okay. Uh, You know, I don't really think he's covered anything that hasn't been covered already. In fact, I don't think he covered anything that wasn't covered by what people said in ones that we have had here. But because he was he's a uh, leader in the Come and Take It group, I wanted to get his word in there, too. But then we have Amy Hedkey. And this is, let's just say the craziest strong in this one. And you'll understand after you hear the next two or three audio clips. Hi, uh, Amy Hedkey, Wichita Hello. Falls. I'm a mom and I am pa- I am ter- testifying on this bill that needs to be very boldly amended. The Republicans at State Convention directed the Republicans in the Senate to prioritize constitutional carry. This bill is about campus carry and license carry. Those are not constitutional carry. That's the opposite direction. Okay. Uh, basically, she's implying that we're taking away rights instead of putting them back. That does not make sense to me, but maybe it does to her in her own little twisted kind of uh, way. But then this next one really gets under the skin of a few people. I'd strongly encourage you to vote the right way the first time and amend this bill to constitutional carry. Those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. I have five kids. I prefer peaceful. 
But you have to prioritize constitutional carry. That's unlicensed any carry anywhere. Our cops are not idiots. There are cops in all these other states that have already figured out how to deal with people open carrying. This is not an issue. The guns on campus is not an issue. If kindergartners and elementary school students can handle it in a lot of ISDs Thank in you, this ma'am. state, you, so can adults. Amy. Wow. It's almost like she is channeling Corey Watkins there. But let's get her to uh, let's go back and get where she explains this a little bit more clearly. And she's asked if she's threatening a violent revolution, because this is this is quite telling. I don't have to threaten anything. I can tell you that's what's going to happen. That's what history over the centuries will tell you. People don't stay in stagnant situations. They don't sit by and watch their rights keep being eroded. Okay, she's uh, she doesn't have to promise or threaten anything because it's going to happen. That's basically what she's saying. But let's go from let's go from her crazy talk all the way to somebody that does a very good job of making his point. Now, some of some of the way he goes about it is, may not be the best, but for somebody that's I mean, he's he's new to the game and he makes a very good impression. I'll be honest. He he impressed me. And I may I may see if I can look him up and get him on the podcast to talk about it in the future. But let's get let me get the audio clip going. My name is Michael Cargill. I'm speaking in support of SB 11 uh, and also speak for the African-American gun owners and gun club here in the state of Texas. Um, the reality is that gun control in this t- in this state was started back in the end of slavery. And because people were terrified by the ideal of a gun being carried by someone who was different from them. Gun control was expanded during the civil rights movement because, again, people were terrified by the ideal of a gun being carried by someone who was different from them. And today, as I hear, you know, I sit in the different rooms and I hear some of the epithets, gun nuts, redneck, uh, banded by some of the opponents, I realize that people still support gun control measures because they are still terrified by the ideal of a gun being carried by someone, anyone who is different from them. It is time to end Jim Crow in America. It's time to end Jim Crow in the state of Texas. It is time to do away with the unjust, unreasonable laws rooted in bigotry and hatred. It is time for the Texas legislator to legalize open carry and uphold the constitution of this great nation and also conceal carry on campus. All righty. I am going to say that he, I mean, he's, he's makes a, he makes his point well. So my hat's off to Michael Cargill. And if he's listening to this and he wants to come on the podcast, all he's got to do is throw me an email and we'll definitely arrange for it. Uh, Sir, keep up the good work if you're listening. And if somebody here is going to uh, listens to it and knows him, let him know that I said keep up the good work. And finally, uh, the last audio clip I want to play about the uh, about the open carry portion of the hearing or the open carry portions of the hearing comes to us from a Moms Demand Action member, Lisa Beckman. Yes, I'm Lisa Beckman, and you guys have been very patient today, and I appreciate you hearing all of our testimony. I am actually from Houston. I'm in Senator Huffman's district, and I am opposed to both of the um, SB 11 and SB 17, and um, I'm also a social media enthusiast, so I've kind of had a front row seat in hearing all of the arguments up to today. And what I can tell you is members of the open carry movement who call open carry a God-given right, they have said repeatedly that they will not comply with whatever laws you pass. They have threatened you, our legislators. They have threatened um, moms across Texas and the United States. And I have a few short examples of those. One man said, I hope your entire family gets raped in a home invasion and then burnt alive while you watch. So pleasant. Another person said, I know where she lives. Let's give her a little visit. Hmm. And then finally, in response to a photo of an event during which we rang bells in remembrance of the victims of Sandy Hook, one man wrote, every time a bell rings, a first grader gets shot. This is what I see in addition to numerous other misogynistic um, things about open carry in social media. So I appreciate today you taking the time to hear the testimony of all of the police, all of the teachers, the professors, the moms, and the students opposed to open carry and opposed to campus carry. Thank you. Okay. Basically all she does, well, these people just say bad things on, 
on, on social media. And- really? Really? That was her testimony? I could have thought of a much better way of, I, I could think of much better ways of testifying than that. I really could. But I understand that she, you know, she's feeling picked on and bullied and things like that. I mean, after all, a lot of it's projection from the open care, uh, from the uh, campus carry bunch. Don't get me wrong. The open carry crowd, they have a lot of people that are not angels. Far from it. But it seems to me that the uh, moms demand action, the mayors against illegal guns, and every town USA, all these groups that Bloomberg funds, they have a lot of people that are far from angels too. In fact, it's more co- it's a more common than not uh, symptom in those groups. However, let's go ahead and consider some things about the uh, about the campus carry hearing. And in order to do that, I got to change pages here in my show notes. And one thing I kept hearing about in the uh, campus carry hearing is, or during the Senate hearing, is the deadly combination of underage drinking and concealed handgun licenses being present with guns. Now I find it interesting that school leaders school law enforcement, and other school employees consider this a problem. You you may be thinking, really? Alcohol and guns don't mix, but that's not what I'm getting at. Most of these drinking parties, especially those that happen with underage students, which is a lot of what they're concerned about, most of these happen off-campus. I mean, these are off-campus affairs where campus carry doesn't even apply. I don't know about you, but to me, uh, that is in and of itself a you know, why are you making this a point? I mean, you're talking about people drinking and carrying guns when they are not supposed to be drinking on college premises. Uh, I don't know about you, but there's a problem here. More troubling is the fact that uh, these administrators, these teachers, these uh, campus law enforcement officials, they seem to be accepting that these parties are happening on their campus and they're doing nothing about it. They're like, yeah, uh, we've got people drinking on our school ground, so you can't have campus carry because, well, uh, they might get a gun when they're drinking illegally on our campus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we need, maybe we need to monitor the dorms where people can't be having wild drinking parties in the dorms. Oh wait, uh, if I'm not mistaken, dorms are already monitored. Hmm. Okay. Maybe we can get the campus police to patrol the campus so they can catch these outdoor parties. I mean, it is public intoxication, seeing as how it is public property. Oh, yeah. Campus police already do patrol the uh, campus, or at least they're supposed to. And any parties that are happening indoors, but they're not in the dorms, well, the police should be able to catch those because, I mean, if you're having a party in a lab then you have an administrator that's, uh, he's uh, facilitating this, or you have a TA, or you have a faculty member of some sort involved in this party. That makes the campus a party to the party. And that just makes, to me, it's, to me, this, uh, I don't think that happens. If it does, then the campus has bigger problems than worrying about license carry by legal adults. Now, one thing I did notice about both the open carry, but especially the campus carry bills, testimony was a lot of these witnesses that are there to testify they actually testify against the bills based on the guns bad basis and uh when you have when you see them in the video and you have uh you have somebody actually they're they're giving testimony about the pro-gun issue they're mocking the pro-gun people and don't think that this was not noticed by the panel of senators on the committee because these people are facing each other But you know what, let's go ahead and get to the audio clips for the uh, campus carry, because this is going to be where it gets really interesting. We're going to go back to Tara Mitchell from the NRA, and we're going to run her first. And she's going to talk about how uh, one or more assailants uh, with one victim. Well, you know what, let me just let her say it. I'd also like to stand in support of Senate Bill 11 by Senator Birdwell. Uh, A lot of the discussion seemed to wrap around mass shooting scenarios. But in my experience, the people that have come to me and asked me to help work on this and get it passed are people who are more concerned with scenarios such as this. It's one victim and one criminal, and the police aren't there. God forbid it's one victim and three or four criminals at the same time. I think that's why students, faculty, staff, that have contacted NRA and being asked you to work on this, want to see campus carry passed. Okay, I want to run the next two back-to-back 
because the first one's Tara Mitchell again, and the second one's Alice Tripp, and she'll actually introduce herself because this is from the start of her testimony. But uh, they fit together very well, and let me just go ahead and, you know what, I think I'm going to run the next three, and the first one's Tara Mitchell, and the second or the last two are Alice Tripp. We actually have local option in the law right now. There's a provision in Penal Code Section 4603A1 that allows uh, institutions to give students or somebody who requests permission to carry written authorization to do so. The fact is they don't, and that's why we're here seeking that ability. I'm going to leave with you a copy of the form letter that you get from University of Texas at Austin when you request permission to carry on campus. There's no, it's two lines long. Thank you for your request. Your request is denied, basically. Thank you, Madam Chairman, committee. My name is Alice Tripp. I lobby for Texas State Rifle Association. And I speak in support, first of all, of uh, Senator Birdwell's bill, SB 11. Uh, and Tara Mitchell brought up the Penal Code 4603 language, which essentially has always allowed uh, a school, including a university, with the written authorization for a person to bring a firearm onto the into the buildings of that school. It allowed Brenham Independent School District to build an indoor shooting range. So we know it mean it works. It, it's allowed at least 20 independent school districts, some as early as 2007, to allow faculty and staff with a concealed handgun license to carry in the building for, for their protection and for the protection of their students. Here we are working on this personal protection issue from 2009 and not one single college has acted in any way to even allow their faculty and staff this option of personal protection when some have testified in previous committees that staffers have been threatened, that um, faculty has had problems. We, we heard testimony from a returning military veteran who was going to night school in Texas State who was in a wheelchair. He's paraplegic. And he testified, you trusted me to carry a machine gun in Fallujah. You don't trust me to carry my licensed handgun when I go to night school. Okay, we have that. Now, let me ask you, is there any question at all after those three audio clips that there is any that, that any local option would that's embedded in the campus carry bill that it would have any value other than essentially killing it? I just ran three audio clips that uh, Tara Mitchell and Alice Tripp are explaining why a local option won't work. I don't need to go into it any better than that. But let's uh let's get a let's get Terry Holcomb's position on campus carry from his testimony. And this one it's not as dramatic or not as effective, but it's still a good thing to hear. Uh, my name is Terry Holcomb. I am the executive director of uh, Texas Carry, and I'm also their primary lobbyist that has um, been working on SB 17 and the companion bill in the House, HB 910. Uh, before I go to SB 17, of course, Texas Carry does uh, 100% uh, speak in favor of the campus carry bill, and we also would defer to the author of the bill for the amendment on the open carry issue. Um, that certainly isn't the intention of SB 17. Okay. Basically, he doesn't really go into any testimony about uh, SB 11, but he's he supports it, as does Texas Carry, his organization. Let's hear from somebody that does not support it. My name is Frances Schenken. I'm the board chair of Texas Gun Sense, which works for common sense gun policy in the state. We are two years old. I oppose Senate Bill 11. I oppose allowing guns in classrooms, whether openly carried or concealed. All righty. Now, the next one's actually someone, someone who's, well, I think, is supposed to be on our side. Uh, this is Rachel Malone from Texas Firearms Freedom. And, well... I think it's best to let you hear her position and then go into a discussion about it. 
Regarding campus carry, I want to thank you, Senator Birdwell, for bringing this important issue up. I work on campuses as a freelance musician. This is very relevant to me. I do affirm private property rights, the ability of private schools to opt out. Um, but it, it, campus carry will save lives. That's the bottom line. I do want to bring up one issue. You said you're affirming second amendment right to self-defense. The U.S. Constitution doesn't say anything specifically about that it has to be concealed or that it requires a, a permit. And the Texas Constitution gives power to regulate with a view to prevent crime. Regulate, requiring concealment isn't proven to prevent crime. In conclusion, uh, unlicensed carry is the most rational, life-saving option. So I ask you to please choose life. Okay, that's pretty good, you know, Uh, but, you know, I think there's a better campus carry argument out there. In fact, I think it may just be this one. You may proceed, Mr. Jennings. Hi, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Well, I was a student at uh, Texas A&M University, double graduate, uh, both bachelor's (laughs) and master's, and I actually founded Texas A&M Students for Concealed Carry on Campus, along with my friend Derek Titus. We raised it to about 2,000 members back when I ran it. Uh, in fact, just recently, the uh, Texas A&M Student Senate passed a resolution calling for concealed carry on campus, and it passed 39 to 12. Um, anyways, I'm here today representing students for concealed carry in support of Senate Bill uh, 11. Uh, Thank you all for allowing me the opportunity to speak on this. Um, I know that you're very familiar with the issue by now, uh, so I'll try to keep this brief. Uh, As a designated representative for students who can still carry on campus, I ask you to please keep the following points in mind when considering whether to legalize licensed concealed carry on Texas college campuses. Uh, It's important to keep in mind that this legislation would in no way change who can carry a gun. Uh, the same trained, licensed, carefully screened adults, age 21 and above, who regularly carry concealed handguns off campus without incidents at movie theaters, shopping malls, churches, and even here in the Texas Capitol, are perfectly capable of doing so in lecture halls. Uh, secondly, it should be noted that the legislation for you today would not change the laws at fraternity houses, bars, tailgate events, or other off-campus parties, uh, the places where students are most likely to drink. Uh, locations where it would change the laws are places such as classrooms and libraries, locations where alcohol fuel parties are virtually unheard of. Uh, third, it's important to consider that the places where this bill would allow licensed concealed carry differ very little from the places where the licensed concealed carry is already allowed. Uh, how different is a campus library, for instance, from a municipal library? Uh, how different is a lecture hall from a movie theater or a crowded church auditorium? Uh, how different is a college cafeteria from Luby's, Luby's cafeteria? Um, thank, you, I, thank you very much, Mr. Jennings. All right. Thank you. All righty, then. That is probably one of the best arguments that somebody has made in a two-minute time span for campus carry. But you got to understand, he's got a lot of practice doing it, too. But now we are going to come to the MDA stretch, or the Moms Demand Action stretch. This is where our next three audio clips are from Moms Demand Action, and they're all talking about trying to kill campus carry. Well, let me run the first one, and then we'll come back and we'll discuss it. Nicole Golden. Uh, Thank you so much for inviting me to testify about this important issue. My name's Nicole. I'm a mom of two and a volunteer with the Texas chapter of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. I'm here today to tell you that I do support the Second Amendment, but I oppose SB 11, the Guns on Campus Bill. This legislation would force our state's colleges and universities to allow guns on their campuses and in their classrooms, despite the fact that university stakeholders in Texas and across the country overwhelmingly oppose guns on campus. The University of Texas's Chancellor McRaven has spoken about the dangers of this legislation. Campus carry is opposed by 95% of college presidents and 94% of college faculty. And not surprisingly, those who police our campuses also believe campus carry is a dangerous idea. In a recent survey of university police chiefs, a staggering 89% said that the most effective way to deal with gun use on campus is to prevent it altogether. A mere 5% of university police thought that allowing students to carry on campus would do anything to prevent shootings. Okay, so she's basically given us all these statistics you know, 95% oppose it here, 94% oppose it here, virtually all oppose it there. <clears throat> is she trying to kill campus carry or is she trying to make sure that there is no support for a local option? Because her arguments are basically good arguments for 
uh, making sure there's no local option. And I don't think that fact was lost on anybody that was uh, there. But then we have Kelly Burke. We have two audio clips from her. And, well, the first one, the first one, a lot of people have already heard. There's a lot of YouTube videos out there about it. But it's basically where she's uh, telling something that's less than truthful to the Senate uh, panel or to the Senate committee. So let's go ahead and run that one. Uh, I'm Kelly Burke, and I'm a constituent of your uh, of District 17 and a neighbor, a fellow Westview neighbor. And I'm a mother of two sons and a graduate of Texas A&M, and I want to voice my opposition to campus carry bill. I'd like to make a few comments on a couple of points touching on why people think we need campus carry. We know, for example, that when it comes to sexual assault on campus, the majority of these incidents happen at the hands of a man that is known to the victim in situations involving alcohol or drugs and where a firearm will bring worse and not less outcome of harm. We do not know about how, quote, responsible CH holders are because that data set is not available and is completely locked down. Any statements about how, quote, responsible and law-abiding CHL are, CHLs are is completely anecdotal and therefore conjecture. Okay. Uh, yeah. You know, I don't think she realized that they pretty much already had all that information about uh, how law-abiding CHL holders were in front of them. You see, there's a state agency that uh, they collect that data and they publish that data on their website called the DPS. And that data is not locked down. It is actually freely available. You can go to texascholforum.com, do a search. You can find where Charles Cotton has actually taken that data and presented it in a much more refined form. But then we get into something else. We get into her uh, conspiracy theory. That's right. She's got a conspiracy theory. And here it is. Uh, I'm Kelly Burke, and I'm a constituent of your uh, of District 17 and a neighbor, a fellow Westview neighbor. And, uh, I'm Kelly Burke. Uh, I'm Kelly Burke, and I'm a constituent. Okay, I don't have a conspiracy theory on here. I got two copies of where she's talking about uh, the data being locked down. Anyways, her conspiracy theory comes in during her testimony, and she's basically saying it's a conspiracy by the gun manufacturers to get campus carry passed so that there's a new market. Yeah. I don't know about you, but that makes absolutely no sense to me. Anyhow, let's get this episode wrapped up. Basically, you have a lot of people here talking about a lot of different things. And I don't know how I lost that last one and overrode it with <laughs> overrode it with this other uh, with the one before it. However, let me just say that I am very pleased with the way this episode's turned out. I'm not running as late as I thought I was going to be. But I still need to hurry through it, so let me run the contact audio clip, and then we'll get to uh, we'll get to the news, and we'll wrap this episode up for you. If you want to contact the podcast, please send an email to Aaron at GunRightsInTexas.com, or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is GunRightsInTexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please. Do so by dialing 409-292-6736. Okay, we're back for the news segment, and the antics of open carry activists hurt their cause more than it helps when it comes to the general public. Now, we have an editorial written by uh, someone with a very strong anti-gun slant, and it's typical of many that you see in newspapers around the state. Now, the issue here isn't an anti-gun media, but it's an out-of-control group of people who never grew out of the I will hold my breath and stop my feet until I get what I want stage. There you go. I read a, com- a completely prepared statement. Okay. Anyways, that the uh, editorial I'm referring to is in the Waco Tribune, which is in C.J. Grisham's backyard. And I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to wrap up uh, that news article, and we're going to move on to our Next one, which is where Governor Greg Abbott has once again stated he plans to sign open carry into law. Now, it's a change in wording, and it almost makes you wonder if he plans to include open carry in a special session should it fail to pass in the regular session. I don't think he would, but it, it, leaves, you, it leaves you wondering if that's a case, uh, if that's a possibility in this case. Now, I'm going to be honest. This is all third-hand information because the newspaper or the uh, news article is a second-hand source, and I'll be honest, just the fact that hes uh, they're saying he stated that he plans to sign open carry in the law, you know, that, that tells me something. 
if it's true, he actually did say that that could be a signal that's being sent uh, to our legislators. And while I normally don't cover news from other states, the fact that Texas groups have announced, you know, a number of them have said they have plans for court action should open carry not pass or be restricted beyond where they like it to be. And that kind of makes me cover this cautionary tale. An appeals court in Florida has ruled that the Florida legislature can enact restrictions on how firearms are carried outside the home without violating the Constitution. Yep. Basically, they're saying, well, you, you got to have some form of uh, carry, but the state can say how it can be done. A lot of people, they don't understand that uh, when you're dealing with the, <laughs> when you're dealing with courts, there's only two type of people that like things to go to court. Idiots and attorneys. Attorneys like it to go to court because they get paid. Idiots like it to go to court because they don't realize that anything that happened that can happen may happen. Well, you know what? I'm going to wrap the episode up. I mean, we're we're well over an hour by now, so let me hit the sign-off music and end this episode. We have a few more news articles, but you know what? Let's not worry about them. We cover a lot of ground today We're on this episode. So when I say take care and carry responsibly, keep in mind, I really do mean it. Carry responsibly, please. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly.